Good morning. I want to welcome you all to uh, First Baptist Church, Hebron, Texas. You know, Texas is a good place to be unless it snows. <laughs> Anyhow, I want to welcome all the visitors we've got and all those people online. Hope to see you guys that are online right now here with us next Sunday. Let's pause with a word of prayer, please. Father, we just thank you so much for the privilege of being in your house to praise you and to worship you. To listen to your word. Be with Steve today as he brings your message to us, Lord. Give us open and receptive hearts. Just lift these things up to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, back a while ago, Steve told us to uh, choose a word to live by for the year. And I think he made a word up. I'm not so sure, but, but he said he did. And uh, my word is hope. And when uh, Jeremiah, I think it was, said, we hope in God, when you look at the Bible a lot, you find out that hope means trust. And so I, I just chose the word hope. And uh, I was also asked my favorite Bible verse, and because I chose the word hope, my favorite Bible verse amongst the whole list of them, a bunch of them, is uh, Romans 12, 12, I think it was. It says, uh, uh, be joyful in hope patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. And, and most important for us these days is to be faithful in prayer. Then I was asked my favorite hymn, and I've got a whole bunch of favorite hymns too, but on top of that list, or near the top, is Great is Thy Faithfulness. And usually the people that are asked to, to open this thing up and welcome everybody are asked to sing. Well, I don't do those things anymore. So one of my blessings has been my daughter Connie. And she's going to help us sing that song today. Great is our faithfulness.
Thank you, John and Connie. That was beautiful. Great hymn. I think all of us have that one as one of our top favorite hymns, that's for sure. Well, it's great to be in the house of the Lord this morning in worship. I want you to stand with me if you're able and can and would like to. We'd love for you to do that. I want you to join us online as we sing also. Great is thy faithfulness and his grace is enough for us. Let's do that. Here we go. y'all a new hymn, a modern hymn, as it were. Even these songs like Great is Thy Faithfulness that were written many years ago at one time were a new hymn. 
And today we have a hymn writer by the name of Keith Getty that has written many hymns and uh, songs of our faith. And this is a new one that he's written that I really like. The, the story within the song is just amazing because it's the story of Christ. And it's the story of our hope. John, your word is hope for this year. And the name of this song is Christ, our hope in life and in death. I want you to listen to these words, and I want you to learn the chorus with us, and we'll sing it again here in another few weeks, but I want you to maybe learn that chorus with us where we can sing that together. Christ, our hope in life and death. Christ alone, Christ alone, what is our only confidence? That our souls belong to Him, who holds our days within His hand. What comes apart from His command, and what will keep me to the love of Christ in which we stand. Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess Christ our hope. Truth can calm the troubled soul. God is good, God is good. Where is His grace and goodness known? In our great Redeemer's blood, who holds our faith when fears arise, who stands above the stormy trial. Who sends the waves that bring us nigh unto the shore, the rock of Christ? Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess. Christ, our hope in life and death. Unto the grave, what will we sing? Christ, He lives, Christ, He lives. And what reward will heaven bring? Everlasting life with Him. Then will we rise to meet the Lord, and their sin and death will be destroyed, and we will feast in endless joy when Christ is ours forevermore. Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs. our love in life and death. Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess. Christ, our hope in life and death, now and ever we Christ, our hope in life and death. 
I love the Gettys. They are they do they do a wonderful wonderful job. All of their music is biblically based, which you don't always find. So thank you for bringing that to us. And John, thank you for not singing <laughs> and bringing Connie instead. That was a, you're a smart man. Uh, you know I. I love to watch people that, that do leadership and how they do leadership. I, as a matter of fact, there's a guy named Bob Buell, and I love to read Bob because he's, he's a leadership kind of guru. And, uh, and I remember reading him one time because I recognized that I possessed a different kind of leadership than everybody else in the room. That bothered me. Made me think, maybe you're not a leader. But I wanted to be in the room, and I wanted impact, and I wanted to say things, and I wanted, to, I wa I wanted all of that to be what God wanted. And I, I was reading it about him, and, and, uh, and he said there are two kinds of leaders, and he said there's the offense, not offensive, there are those as well, but there's the, the offensive person, the person that's always thinking about the touchdown and scoring and all that, and then you have the defense, and he said, think back to when you were a child and when you were like in the fourth grade, uh, if you were one of the guys that, uh, that got to choose the other players. You know, you work your way up the bat. You remember when you used to do that, Reggie? And if you got the top hand, you got to pick the first guy. And, uh, you know, if, if you're a real leader, you pick that kid that was never going to get picked first, just to intimidate the other team. Uh, but then he, he, he went on to say, if you play a sport, football, baseball, basketball, doesn't matter what it is, think back, were you more interested in the offense or the defense? Because he says you never grow out of that. And it shows up again in your leadership style. I thought that was fascinating. And, and I got to thinking about it, and I remember, I remember going home from ball games, and my dad would say, you know, how, how did you do? And I said, man, dad, three guys tried to steal on me, and I nailed them, all three of them. And he'd look at me and go, did you get a hit? And I'd say, yeah, I went three for four, had six RBIs. That didn't matter to me. What mattered more to me was the defense, to be the catcher, to call the game. And so that's, that has proven true for me, you know, to, to understand how my leadership comes out. Uh, it's like Troy Aikman. I had the privilege, uh, a buddy of mine, John Weber, great guy, was the chaplain of the Texas Rangers and the Dallas Cowboys. And so I, I got to do several of their chapels. They, they all go to chapel before they go to war. And uh, it, was, it was so neat because I was, I was there. You remember that team that used to win with the triplets? Remember that team? That's when I got to go do. And I, I think it was just my prayer life and uh, what it was I was sharing. No, it wasn't that at all. But uh, when you get there, they all go into meetings. They have meetings for, you know, for the linemen. They have meetings for the quarterbacks. They have meetings for all these different things that are going on in the game before it happens. But one of the most fascinating things was that Troy Aikman never went to the quarterback meeting. He would go to the defensive back meeting. And, and he wanted to know about the defensive backs on the other team. He knew what he was going to do as a quarterback, but he wanted to know what were those guys going to do? How quickly can they break on the ball after I throw it? And it was those guys that could say, hey, if that guy's five feet away from Michael Irvin and you throw the ball, he can close on it and he will take it and run it all the way to the other end. And so he was getting his wisdom from the defense, getting his wisdom from the other side because he was thinking offensively. He was thinking score. And he turned out to be one of the most accurate quarterbacks in all NFL history. And I think it's because he was listening to the other side of leadership. That's the other side of leadership. That's the side of leadership that, uh, that, that Nehemiah brings. You know, we started with Ezra, and Ezra is the great priest, and he came in and he rebuilt the temple. They're coming back out of captivity after 90 years of captivity, and and it's Ezra that comes and sets up the temple, and it's Ezra that comes and, and sets up the altar and does all that. But it's going to be Nehemiah, the defensive expert, that's going to come in and build the wall. And then, of course, Zerubbabel is the other player in the game. He's, he's like the governor, if you will. And, it, you know, it's not just true in sports, uh, but it is true in sports. As a matter of fact, 
if you watch the Super Bowl, I saw one of our visitors with a little Kansas City thing, and, and, and the reason we all had to weep because Tampa Bay was whooping Kansas City, and everybody wants to, everybody wants to, uh, to, to praise Tom Brady, and he did a great job, but it was the defense that won the game. It was, it was those guys that knew how to protect the end zone. It, all, it, it works in, in, in every way, uh, place in life. And I read, because I knew Jose was going to be here, I read about being second chair, violin. And when you think about a second chair, you think, well, he's just not as good as the soloist. Or he's not as good as the first chair. I learned a lot of stuff. I learned that, that, that you can have more than one first chair. I didn't know that. And, and you can have more than one second chair. And it doesn't necessarily mean, like, if you have five first chairs, it doesn't mean that the guy that is the, the, over the second chair doesn't mean he's not as good as the first chair. He's just different. See, we all look at that and say, oh, first chair, whoa. No, they're, they're equally important. And when I was reading about it, they said, any conductor will tell you the most important person in the orchestra, the entire orchestra, second chair. Second chair violins, because he sets the tone. It says, says in there, he sets the bow. I have no idea what that means. I'm guessing it means everybody's in the right spot, right? Uh, because if you, don't get it, if you don't hit it in the right spot, it'll sound nasty. And, uh, and, and he's the guy that sets the bow for, for everybody in the orchestra. So that is this kind of leader that we're looking at. That's the kind of leader he is, and, and we're going to talk about him. We've been talking about, and one of the major things we've seen is that he prays. I was, I was looking at, at, at prayer, and I knew that uh, Nehemiah had to do some bold praying before he ever approached the, the king about what it was he wanted to approach him about. And I, I found these, these two things about uh, two great reformers, uh, Martin Luther. Martin Luther had a co-worker who fell sick. I want you to listen to the boldness of Martin Luther. If you've never studied Martin Luther, he was quirky. He, he, was, he, it's, he, was, he was out there. But I think what, sometimes when you're, you're a leader, you are out there. Now, now he's not a defensive leader. He, this guy is all offense. Martin Luther is amazing. And he said, listen to how he, how he, he sends a note to his co-worker who's ill. And, and they told him that his co-worker was very ill. And he said, I besought the Almighty with great vigor. I attacked him with his own weapons, quoting from Scripture, all the promises I could remember that prayers should be granted, and said that he must grant my prayer. If I henceforth to put faith in his promises, the Lord will never let me hear that you are dead. But will permit thee to survive me. For this I am praying, this is my will be done, because I seek only to glorify the name of God. That's a bold prayer. Can you imagine? I mean, in our day, we, we sort of come with a, a, almost an apology to God. Martin Luther, the great reformer, just went a hold and grabbed hold. It's like, it's like he grabbed him by the shirt and just shook God with his prayer. Then uh, there's a guy named Adam Clark who was traveling with John Wesley, and they were coming over to America, and they were ready to do all the things that they would do in America for the, for the uh, enlightenment of this new nation. And uh, there came a storm, and the storm got so bad it, it pushed the ship off off course, and, and the captain had no idea where they were going. As a matter of fact, uh, Adam Clark came down because he had heard in the chaos of the crew that they were about to sink. They said they were just seconds away from sinking. John Wesley at the time was reading, reading in his cabin when, when the storm came. And, uh, and he got up after talking to Adam Clark without saying a word, and he walked over in a corner and got on his knees, and he prayed this. Almighty and everlasting God, thou hast, swayed every, thou, thou hast sway everywhere, and all things serve the purpose of thy will. Thou holdest the winds in thy fists, 
and sitteth upon the water floods, and reigneth as a king forever. Command these winds and these waves that they obey thee, and take us speedily and safely to, hev- to a haven whither we go, would go. And Adam Clark said, after he said amen, he got up, returned to his chair, and began to read again. That's confidence. And the sea calmed, by the way. That is great confidence. In, uh, in our faith, and faith is, is to be patient, uh, I, I was reading Isaiah, and Isaiah 28, 16, I'm sure was one of the emphasis that Nehemiah was thinking about. It says, therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I am placing a foundation stone in Jerusalem, a firm and tested stone. It is a precious cornerstone that is safe to build on. Whoever believes needs never be shaken. Nehemiah has in his mind and his heart that he is going to build a wall. Here's, what, here's a, another thing Nehemiah knew as a leader. He knew that God is a God of surprise. So often we wonder what's God going to do next, and then all of a sudden you look up and God surprises us with an amazing thing. That's why Jesus in Matthew 17, 20 says, if you have the faith uh, uh, as small as a mustard seed, and a mustard seed is the smallest seed you can find that grows anything, he said, you can say to this mountain, move from here and to there, and it will move. And God loves it when we pray like that. Matter of fact, Zechariah talks about Zerubbabel in uh, chapter 4 of Zechariah in verses 6 through 7. He sa- uh, 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 Zer- he's quoting uh, Zerubbabel, and he says, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. If you say to this mountain, it will become a plain, and it shall bring the top stone amid shouts of grace to it. See, Zerubbabel knows we're going to build a wall. And he's, he's like shopping around, picking a mountain. And he knows if we just tell that mountain to move and we pray about it and we get into action, that, that mountain possesses the cornerstone that we're going to place to begin the building. So, that's my setup. To rebuild the city of his ancestors is what he wants to do. So Nehemiah, in Nehemiah chapter 2, in verses uh, 1 through 5, he says, Early following spring, in the month of of, uh, Nisan, during the twelfth year of King uh, Artaxerxes, Yeah. Artaxerxes, okay? I'll just say it twice because I couldn't say it at all last week. Uh, I was serving the king his wine, and I had never before appeared sad in his presence. There's a reason why Nehemiah had never been sad in his presence, because that held a death sentence. Uh, you, talk about, you talk about not having anybody around you that's going to tell you the truth. You know, the, you know the old story about the king's naked and nobody will tell him? Well, back in a day, you didn't do that. I mean, you didn't even appear sad in front of the king because he would take that as an offense and you would die. And so he's appearing before the king and he can't help himself. He's sad. And so the king asked me, why are you looking so sad? You, you don't look sick to me. You must be deeply troubled Then I was troubled, because now he knows that the king is seeing that he said. He said, but I replied, long live the king. It's his way of saying this has nothing to do with you. (laughs) You're, You're not making me sad at all. But he tells him, long live the king. How can I not be sad? For the city where my ancestors are buried is in ruin, and the gates have been destroyed by fire. And the king asked, well, how can I help you? 
Isn't it amazing how God had gone before him? It's, it's because Nehemiah had been praying. He had been praying for the king, that the king would recognize this was a big deal to him. And, and he was waiting, and the king brought it up. Why do you look so sad? You know, a lot of times, you know, when, when you're in leadership, you keep wanting to be instructional. You just kind of want to, want to come in and kind of tell everybody what to do and how to do it. And sometimes, sometimes it's a lot smarter just to kind of wait and just kind of be there. You know, Jesus did a lot of confrontation with what? Just a look. When Peter denied him, he didn't, he didn't have to point at him and scream at him. and He just had to look at him. And many times people can tell what's going on just by how you look. And the king looked at him and he knew he was bad. He knew, it was, he knew he was troubled. And he says, then with a prayer to God of heaven, I replied, if it pleased the king and if you are if you are pleased with me, your servant, send me to Judah to rebuild the city where my ancestries are buried. It's a plea. Let me go. Turn me loose from slavery. And let me go back to my city where my ancestries are that I might rebuild the city. This is a bold ask. You talk about being confident in your prayer life. Well, that, one, of the, one of the greatest things that can happen to you as a believer is that, is that you would mature in your prayer life, that you actually would pray and then be able to expect God to move on your prayer and watch for it and not be troubled if it comes out different. But you go before the throne of God with expectation and with confidence. You know, the believers of today are to live with a humble confidence in God. And we forfeit it all the time. We look at other things that we can be confident in. Like, just about everybody I know is freaking out because we changed leadership in the White House. Okay? So, God owns the heart of that king, whoever it is. God knows what's happening in your world. And we act as though we're not even bombarding heaven to protect our nation. Because we're not. Part of the problem that America is having, morally, is the lack of the prayer of God's people. Great leaders pray for their people. Nehemiah had prayed for his people while they were in captivity. He didn't even, he hadn't even, he had never even experienced the city of Jerusalem. He had spent his life in captivity, but he had spent his life in the Word of God. He had spent his life praying, and he knew that it was there. Just like you've never stepped a toe into heaven yet, but you know it's there. And you know that from, from there comes the answer to all of that you need in life. So he operates in a, in a humble confidence. Look at verses 6 through 8. It says, The king with the queen sitting beside him asked, How long will you be gone? They didn't want to let go. They had a good relationship. Nehemiah is said to be the cupbearer, and certainly he would bring the drink that the, that the king would drink. Matter of fact, he would have to taste it before he'd hand it to him, make sure it didn't have poison. And, uh, and, and, then, and then he would care for the king, and he became somebody that the king counted on for wisdom. He recognized that Nehemiah had skills in leadership, and he would ask him questions about things, and he would bring him into his world. We all need people like that in our world, people that we can go to, that we can talk to, people that can give us suggestions. We don't live our lives or even lead in a vacuum. If you do, you're a horrible leader. Leaders involve their people in decisions, and that's what he was doing. So they were wondering, you know, when will you return? And, and after I told him how long I would be gone, the king agreed to my request. I can only imagine. 
I can only imagine how, you know, I'm sure Nehemiah, God put in his heart months ago that he was going to do this. And, and I'm sure he was anxious. You know, when God puts something in your heart, you don't just immediately go, okay. Some people do. The Martin Luthers and the John Wesleys. But for the most part, those of us who have followed Christ, God puts something in your mind and he puts something in your heart and you begin to kind of what I call Moses out. You say, God, not me. I see the job that needs to be done, but you can't be talking to me. And, and you begin to look at yourself. But Nehemiah had figured out how to look away from himself, how to make this bold request of God that led him to making a bold request of the king. And, and so he, since it went so well, he thought he'd ask for more. Pretty good, huh? You, you ever sold a house? You know, and, and uh, Donna and I sold a house in Florida, and it, it lasted one day on the market. And you know what my first thought was? My first thought wasn't, thank you, Jesus. My first thought was, we should have asked more. We left money on the table. And, and, and I think Nehemiah comes with both of that in his heart. I think he's, I think he's, he's thank you, Lord, but at the same time, I'm going to ask for some more. So he also said to the king, if it please the king, let me have letters addressed to the governors of the province, province west of the Euphrates River, instructing them to let me travel safely through their territories on my way to Judah. There were people who did not want Jerusalem, or Judah, to be built back up. There are people in this area the, right by the Euphrates River who hate them. They didn't go back to a, a friendly neighborhood. They had adversaries. And, and, he, and he goes on, and please give me a letter addressed to, to Asaph. Now, uh, I'm going to pause there because Asaph is the manager of the king's forest. That means he's in charge of the lumber yard, the forest. The forest was a big deal. You don't build anything without a big, healthy forest. And so the guy that is in charge of the forest is also a Hebrew. Asaph is a Hebrew name. Nehemiah is a Hebrew name. And although they were, sin, they were, they were slaves, they were highly regarded at what they did. And so he's, he says, he says as, long as, I'm, as long as I'm asking for stuff, uh, uh, the manager of the king's forest instructing him to give me timber, I will need it. It, I will need it to make the beams for the gates of the temple and the fortress, for the city walls, and for a house for myself. I think Nehemiah is kind of telling him, I'm, I'm not coming back. You ask me when I'll be back. He didn't answer the question, but now I think he answers it. He said, I'm going to need lumber. If without lumber, I can't build anything. I can't, I can't build the gates that I'm going to build. I can't build the wall the way it needs to be built. I can't fortify the city without the lumber. And so he tells him, uh, I will need that for the houses and for myself. And, and the king granted these requests because the gracious hand of God was on me. When he left that meeting, he didn't, he didn't leave thinking, look what I just did. He left it surprised at the glory of God. He left it thinking, God, you are magnificent. You are amazing in all that you do. And God allowed him to see it. He was going to need that memory. And every, every leader does need a memory like that. Uh, in in uh, chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, uh, it talks about the tough neighborhood. It says, And when I came to the governor of the province west of the Euphrates River, I delivered the king's letters to them. And the king, I said, should add, had sent the letters to them, and the king, the king, I should add, had sent along an army officer of horsemen to protect me. 
But when Sanballat, the, the Horonite, and uh, Tobiah, the Ammonite officials, heard of my arrival, they were very displeased that someone had come to help the people of Israel. Very displeased. And Nehemiah is going to have trouble with those guys from now on. Because they were very displeased. They, they weren't just unhappy. They began plotting against Nehemiah. Later they will come up with a plan pretending to be his friend so that they can kill Nehemiah. And Nehemiah knew it. God had told him ahead of time what to do. And so Nehemiah now is he's ready to take on the wall. But, but before he comes in, and every, as every great leader should, he, he has to assess what the situation is. You know, sometimes those of you who are bold leaders just sort of walk in and take charge. Matter of fact, some people have that personality that they'll walk into a room and if nobody looks like they're in charge, they'll take charge. They may not know what they're taking charge over. There's a, there's a great thing that, that, that we do sometimes to help people understand their personality. It's called a disc, right? And there's four different personalities. There's a great analogy in there about a forest. And, uh, and depending on which, which you are, and it's a, like a D-I-S-C. And, it, and, uh, and it, it's, it's the, the, il the illustration is this. Somebody comes along, and those four personalities are standing there. And the person says, okay, I need for you people to cut down the forest. Okay? So then the person walks away. Well, the deep personality takes charge immediately. All right, you guys go get a couple saws. You two work together. Let's get going here. All right, get in there. I can cut that forest down. I've cut down bigger forests than that. That's no big deal to me. And he starts in with that. Well, well the, the I is, uh, is also as gregarious as the D, but he's in it for the fun. And so he's following the D because the D's headed toward the forest, but the other two personalities are not. So the eye turns around and says, come on, it'll be fun. We'll have Mexican for lunch. It'll be awesome. We'll have a lot of time to, you know, we'll have fellowship. We'll build our muscles. He's selling it, right? Because that's his personality. Well, then he's selling it to the S. And the S is a steady person. The S is the person who sees the D and the I, and he realizes they're going to go in there and make a mess. And so he says, hey, wait a minute, wait, just let me, I'll go in there and I'll mark the trees that we cut down first. If you guys go in there the way you're going in there, somebody's going to get hurt. She, I'll, I'll figure out how we're going to stack them. I'll figure out how we're going to get them so wherever they need to go. But let me just go mark them all out and make sure, you know, and they're, they're that. And so now all three of them are headed into the forest and they turn around and there's the sea. And they look at her and I, I said her, I didn't mean to. Kind of merry to see. Uh, and I'm the eye. So I never met a detail I couldn't ignore. Uh, but a C, they want to know details, right? And, they, and the, the three turn and say, come on. And that person says, who was the person that told us to, to take down the forest? What authority do they have? What is their interpretation of the forest? How far does it go? Where are the lines? Where do we begin? Where do we stop? Where are all the animals that are living in those trees going to go when we cut the forest down? What are they going to use the wood for? And here come the details. You see? So you need all those personalities to get any job done, believe it or not. Uh, if, if, and, and if you're a strong leader, this is the greatest thing about my leadership. I know, don't put me in charge of the details. I know that. That's good, I know that. Because there are other people who are great at details. Put them in charge of those details. And just encourage them about the details. Um, so, you'll have fun. A quick story. This church in Toledo, Ohio, wanted me to come and, and think about being their pastor. I didn't want to go to Toledo, Ohio. You know. I didn't, that's the mistake on the lake as far as I'm concerned. It freezes there. It's cold. I didn't want to go there. And, and the guy called like eight times. And, and Donna said, you know, if that guy calls one more time, you owe him a visit if he's that persistent. And I said, okay, if he ever calls again, I'll go. 
called again. I said, okay. And he, he gave me, I guess, some details. Uh, but he told me just, you know, fly to Detroit, be in Detroit by such and such a time. And so I told Donna, okay, we're going. So we get on the airplane, and, uh, and I haven't explained anything about the visit. Why? Because I don't know. I didn't get any details. And so we're sitting on the plane, and Donna says, who's picking us up? Well, I don't know. <laughs> the guy. Okay. What's the guy's name? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I've talked to him several times. I, it's either Mike or Al. I, I, I can't remember which. Not sure. You know, you don't know his name? No. Do you have his phone number? No. We're flying to Detroit. Does he know? Yeah, yes, he told me to go to Detroit. And I said, well, what are you going to do? Get off the plane and look around? I said, yeah. And, and I said, I'm going to get off the plane like I'm looking for somebody, and hopefully he's looking for me. And I said, then you're going to run up and go, I'm Donna. Hello. And he'll tell you his name, and then we'll all have his name. <laughs> Worked it out. And she said, okay, so what are we doing? Where, where, where are we staying? Are we staying with somebody or are we staying in a hotel? I don't know. You didn't ask? No, I didn't ask. I don't know. And uh, it got worse. <laughs> it got worse. Uh, I remember they told me that, that they were going to meet us for breakfast on Wednesday, and then on Wednesday night they wanted Donna to sing. And uh, it just it went, I'm talking downhill because I was remembering stuff as she was asking. And, uh, and, but see, because she knows me, she had music in her bag. She had the right clothes. Uh, she was willing to stay with wherever we were going to stay. And because uh, she knew. She knew I didn't know any of that. And, uh, and we got through it. And we're still married today. <laughs> Whew. In uh, 11 through 15, Nehemiah says, So I arrived in Jerusalem. Three days later, I slipped out during the night taking only a few others with me. I had not told anyone about the plans God had put in my heart for Jerusalem. And we took no pack animals with us except the donkey, and I, the donkey I was riding. And after dark, I went out through the valley gate, past the jackal well, jackal's well, and over to the dung gate to inspect the broken walls and the burnt gates. And then I went to the fountain gate and, and to the king's pool, but my donkey couldn't, couldn't get through the rubble. So, so, uh, so though it was still dark, I went up to the Kidron Valley instead of inspecting the wall before I turned back. This is, it's, it's amazing He's, he's gotten there, and he's taken three days rest, and he hasn't said anything to anybody. He's just kind of letting, letting things settle. And he can't go by day because he's got enemies. So he goes by the cover of night, and he's inspecting the wall by the cover of night. Kind of reminds me of Shakespeare's King Henry VIII. You know, they're going to be outmatched by the French. It's four to one. And, and he takes off his kingly garb in, in Shakespeare, and he, he dresses like just the other guys. And he goes from campfire to campfire to campfire. And he just listens to the men talk. And he listens to how afraid some of them are, and he listens to how bold some of the others are. So in the morning, he gets up, and he makes this amazing speech. And he says, once more unto the breach, dear friends, once more. Or bury your English dead. And he goes into this soliloquy. It's, it's magnificent. And he talks about this is the day of St. Crispin's. And this is what this war is going to be called. This is going to be a famous battle. And those who can't pull up their sleeves and show their scars from this battle will call their life cheap. And he says, if you have no stomach for it, depart. Go back to your home. Of course, they all stayed. They go fight the French. They beat them up. It's awesome. You should go listen to it. King Henry VIII. 
Shakespeare. Same kind of drama. Same drama. Nehemiah is, is inspecting the wall because when he, when he presents his plan, it's going to be coherent. People are going to see it as from God. So often people come up with, with ideas and sometimes they'll, they'll cast them out as though they're a vision, but they have no plan because they didn't take the time for God just to put it firmly in their heart. You know, it's, you can't just be an idea man. If you're going to lead, you have to have a strategy. You have to have a plan. You have to get it in order in your own mind, or you'll never be able to convince anybody else what to do. That's really the hardest thing about leadership. Sometimes you just got to back off, and you got to think it all the way through, and you got to see it. In 16 through 18, the city officials did not know I had been out there or what I was doing. For I had not yet said anything to anyone about my plans. I had not yet spoken to the Jewish leaders, the priests, the nobles, and the officials, or anyone else in the administration. But now I said to them, You know very well what trouble we are in. Now he's ready to cast the vision because he's aware of what the problem is and he can articulate the problem to them and they already know what it is, but he's going to give them a vision for what it could be. You know very well what the trouble is. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. Let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and end this disgrace. Then I told them about how gracious the hand of God had been on me and about my conversations with the king. And they replied at once, yes, let's rebuild the wall. So they began the good work. When he began to share how God was in it, the difference that this wasn't just a good plan, this was a God plan, and how God had already blessed, then they were ready to go. He knew exactly what was going to happen? He played it exactly right. He understood how to, how to guide. And I would, I would say he's what Bob Buell would call that leader that enjoyed defense better than offense. Just a different style, different from Ezra. Ezra came in crying out to the Lord and just telling him up front, here's what we're going to do. Not Nehemiah. Nehemiah comes in with a different kind of personality, a different kind of plan. And then in verses 19 and 20, Nehemiah clarifies the truth. But when Sanballat and Tobiah and, and Grisham, the, the, the uh, Arab, heard of, of our plan, they scoffed contemptuously. What are you doing? Are you rebuilding against the king? Rebelling against the king? They ask, and I replied, the God of heaven will help us succeed. Not what these guys want to hear. We, his servants, will start rebuilding the wall, but you have no share, legal right, or historic claim in Jerusalem. Man, I love that. I love it that the man of God has guts enough to look at, to look at the, the, the leaders that are in the area and say, tell you what, you have no share, no legal right, or historical claim. That's what I want to say to, to a government who is taking away our religious liberties. We need to be Nehemiahs. As they scoff, you just need to look right at them and say, no. You have no legal right, moral right, no reason under God to attack. And our God will see us through. Thanks for sharing. Get out. You know, Mike Singletary, great linebacker for the Bears, probably the best defensive player ever to come out of Baylor for sure. But uh, he, had, he had these eyes, scary kind of eyes. I mean, they, they never blinked. 
I love watching those NFL films where they show Singletary and he's lining up and his eyes are just just there, the intensity this guy had. And he was amazing. I, I was watching a game and, uh, and he just played phenomenal. It seemed like wherever the ball was, Singletary was there. Didn't matter where he started. If he started on the other side of the field and the ball went that way, somehow or other, Singletary got from where he was over to where the ball was and he's tackling whoever's running the ball. He's amazing. And this reporter said, how in the world do you get double teamed like you're getting? Two linemen hit you and keep you from going somewhere, and all of a sudden, you know, they knock you down, and we look up, and you're making a tackle. What is the secret? Love Singletary's answer. He said, I get up. <laughs> it's a great answer. It's not that Nehemiah knows he's going to get knocked down some. He knows that this is not going to be easy. Serving Christ is not easy. Standing up for what, what you believe in the workplace, not easy. Being God's man, God's woman, where he's put you, not easy. You're going to get knocked down. And the only thing you can do is get up. Get up and stay after it. Matter of fact, I, I love what Jimmy Draper says. He said, he said, if I fall, I like to fall forward that way. I remember which way I was going when I get up. It's the way to go. You remember Coach Pat Dye, coached the, the great Auburn teams in, in, uh, in the 80s and the 90s. He, he had his coaches together, and they were getting ready. They were going to go out, and they were all going to recruit. And so he says to him, he says, okay, men. He said, you got that kid out there who you knock him down, he stays down. And his coaches go, we don't want that kid. No, we don't want that kid. He said, you got that kid out there, you knock him down, he gets up, you knock him down again, he doesn't get up. Coach, we don't want that kid. No, we don't want that kid. And he says, now you got that kid out there. He said, you knock him down, he gets back up. You knock him down, he gets back up. You knock him down, he gets back up. No matter how many times you knock him down, he's getting back up. And the coaches go, that's the guy we want. That's the guy we want. And Coach Dye says, no, no, no. We want the guy knocking everybody down. <laughs> I love that. That's good coaching. Well, Nehemiah encourages all to work with him, not for him. The great leaders we know anything about, they don't want you working for them. They want you working with them. Great leaders say, are you coming? Are you behind me? Have I got you? Great leaders bring people with them. And, and, they, and they rejoice in who they have. They rejoice in the people that are, that are there with them, working with them. Nehemiah had two major concerns, and he kept it simple. His two major concerns were the good of the nation and the glory of God. I can't think, I can't think of two better concerns for the church of Jesus Christ to embrace today. The good of a nation and the glory of God. And the good of the nation is that God's church gets up, gets out, begins to share the gospel, begins to share with the weapons that we have, the, the, just, the, just the word of God, and, and sharing the gospel, and being out there. And I guarantee you, you know, all the ills that, that we complain about, all, the, all that we complain about, is, is solved by salvation. People need to be saved. You can't expect morality without salvation. I mean, that's pretty basic. And by the way, you know, we talk about, but it feels like we're being persecuted. That's good. Church just gets lazy and fat and wrong when it's not being persecuted. I think the greatest thing that has happened to us in the last few years is we're now feeling some persecution. You want to see where the church is growing, you go where they're being persecuted. Go to Cuba. You'll see it. Great persecution. Does it bother them? No. They call it a special time. And the church is exploding. Same thing in China. Same thing in Russia. Same thing throughout the world. Persecution is not our enemy. It's our energy. Nehemiah knew that. He knew he was going to be persecuted the whole time he did the wall. 
Matter of fact, he's going to have trouble with his own people halfway through the job. By the way, that happens. If you're ever leading anybody and you've got a job going halfway through, lots of problems. It's just the way it goes. If you've ever done anything, you know that. If you've ever built anything, if you've ever been a part of anything, you'll know that some of the problems come from within and some of the problems come from without. We're getting ready to knock down our old building and put a new one up. And there's going to be trials, persecutions all along the way. It's just the way it's going to be. And we're just going to let Heather handle all of them. <laughs> She's in charge. No, we're not. No, we're not. We're going to link arms and we're going to attack the thing as, as leaders, all of us. All of us. You know why? Because there's some get-it-done people out here. There's some, there's some Ds. There's some Is. There's some party animals out there that, that know how to keep everybody encouraged. There's some Ss that know how to keep everybody moving in the right direction and not getting out of their gifts. And then there's some Cs that will wear us out with the details. Got to have them all. You can't get it done without all of God's people. That's why he's made us all unique. That's why he's given every one of us a different gift. Because he wants us to employ it into the body of Christ. This is going to be a lot of fun, building a building. Bunch of fun. Because we believe that this is what God wants us to do. And it's going to take our labor. It's going to take our money. It's going to take all that. And, and, and we, we need that energy. Um, so he had, he had these two concerns, two major concerns, which I'm personally going to adopt those two concerns. Those are my two concerns. The good of a nation and the glory of God. Then he had three objectives. Uh, I love objectives. I, I, I don't, you know, you, if you say, tell me what your goal is, I'll go, I'll have a goal. Got objectives. Goals are too ethereal for me. Objectives sound like you're just kind of in the middle of it, just kind of working it along. And he had these three objectives. Show the need. That's why, he, that's why he went and looked at the wall, because he was an expert on the ruins. When he, when he spoke up to the leaders, he knew exactly what he was talking about. He knew that every gate was destroyed. He knew that they were wide open. He knew how to express that. And so he knew I have to show the need. He knew that back before he talked to the king. He knew if I ever bring this up before that king, I have to show the need. That's why he had the wisdom to ask for wood. That's why he had the wisdom to, to ask for protection, because he knew the need. Second thing, outline the task. Outline the task. It's a disgrace. We're in ruin. He's outlined the task. Then he assures God's blessing. Assures God's blessing. You know, this is so current. Scripture, scripture reads like this morning's news. Except it's not fake news. It's real. It's real. The church of Jesus Christ needs to go to work for the nation, to the glory of God. Our objectives need to be to show the need to a lost world. Show their need for Jesus. Build a framework in which they no longer look at the church and think of hypocrites or bad things or awful things that have happened. You know, we've run more people out of church than we're running people in church. And most of the offense comes from the guy right here. It's how sad it is sometimes when we, you talk to somebody and they've been offended from the pulpit and they, they don't need anything to do with church. We've got to show the need. And the need is to be empathetically loving them in Christ. That's the need of the world. I'm an old 60s guy. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. Not for just some, but for everyone. And the world has it. It has it in Jesus Christ. So we show the need. And then we outline the task. The New Testament 
primarily the book of Acts, outline the task for us to go out and share the gospel, to go out and, and be a part of your culture and make a difference in your culture, the kind of difference that the Lord Jesus Christ made when he entered into that culture that he entered in. And go suffer if you must. And you will. And then finally, assure God's blessing. Make sure you don't do a thing without praying. Make sure you don't make a move without the power of God. There is so much God wants to do through the power of his, his Holy Spirit through each and every one of us. If we ever, ever land on that. If we ever get to the place where we fully understand the grace of God that he has given us, the forgiveness of sin, the eternal life that is waiting for us. If we ever get a real picture of how God suffered and died for us, and we are now children of eternity, and if we ever fully understand the power of the Holy Spirit, how it comes in and it seals you until the day of redemption and how it, it becomes a resident teacher. It allows the Word of God to come alive in your heart. It gives you wisdom and grace and the power to be just like the Lord Jesus Christ. When we understand that is the grace of God, you won't be able to hold the church back. They'll meet the need. They'll outline the culture, and they will assure people of God's grace. That's the work that Nehemiah is going to do, and it's the work we're going to do. Father, thank you. Thank you for showing us through this great story, this great truth out of Scripture, how we are to lead. And I pray, God, you would help us in every aspect of our life that we would become mission-minded in our efforts. That it, is, it wouldn't be just us and a few more. It would be, God, you're sending us out into a diseased culture. It's a disgrace. And yet, God, we hold the answer. May we not keep it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're going to stand and have a time of invitation. And the invitation is the invitation for you to ask God what it is he wants you to do. Ask God to give you a, a deep concern for the culture that you live in, a deep concern for the blessing that God wants to be, a deep concern how God wants to use you just to glorify himself. And it's not about how wonderful you are, it's about how great God is. If we would just step aside and say, God, I'm, I'm yours. God, the answer is yes. God, send me. I promise you, he will send you and he will equip you. and He will guide you. And he will give you godly results. Results that surprise you. Results that keep you in the fight. Maybe you've been that kid that's been knocked down. Get up. Get up. Make it happen. All you have to do is just say, God, I want to be obedient in every area of my life to you. Father, that's our prayer. Eat the Father's love for us. How vast the unknown That he should give his only son To make a wretch's treasure How great the pain of searing loss The Father turns his face away As wounds which mar the chosen sons to
my sin upon his shoulder ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out upon the scoffers it was my sin that held him there until it was a I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart, His wounds have paid my ransom. Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an But this I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom Amen. You may be seated. We are getting ready to start Annie Armstrong. Our Annie Armstrong offering will go for uh, several weeks on up through Easter. I'm excited about Easter. Boy, don't miss Easter. And, uh, and, and if we're just going to have a, a big old time. One of the saddest things for me at COVID was we didn't get to have Easter in person. So we had to do it online. And uh, we're hopefully, God willing, we're going to be here for Easter. I'd love to fill it up. And, uh, and so, but we need to get after Annie Armstrong. We're going to show a quick video uh, that talks about Annie Armstrong, where, that, where those funds uh, go to help. We had, we had a really good, good life back in Brazil, a really comfortable life in Brazil. My wife, uh, she was a lawyer for the government, and uh, I was uh, a pastor in my, in my church. And then I visited a friend here in New England. He showed me around and he showed me people not knowing Jesus. We got over uh, 500,000 Brazilians living in all New England. And then I realized that God was calling us. We took the flight and we landed here in, uh, in Boston. 20 days after this, my wife delivered our daughter. I spoke uh, zero English at that time. It wasn't easy, our beginning here. I had to be strong for my wife and for my daughter. So I didn't give myself this opportunity to give up. And I remember that my first job was working at Dunkin' Donuts. So I met a few Brazilians there and we started some small groups. And our focus was really specific to reach non-believers and to reach people who, who didn't know Jesus. So basically, my ministry is based on a friendship. And uh, the people who attend the church uh, are your friends. We started like gathering with people and we found a place and uh, we started doing Sunday services. When people give, they are really helping uh, some families to thrive and to survive, uh, especially uh, at the beginning of the journey. For me and for my family, it's been uh, uh, vital. What I'm learning is if God called you, He will provide. That is true. If God calls you, he will provide, and the way he'll provide is through God's people. 
Uh, we don't have to count on anybody else. So we're going to be all the month uh, and through, probably through Easter, we're going to be giving to Annie Armstrong. And that's just one great story. Missionary from Brazil to America. Think about it. Uh, and that's, that's a, a glorious thing. As there are people groups here, God is bring, bringing the world to the United States. There are hundreds of foreign mission opportunities that land every day at the Dallas airport. And, uh, and so God is doing a wonderful, wonderful thing that we need to take advantage of. Uh, I have one other announcement. Well, two. We're here on Wednesday nights. We're doing the hot potato things. That's when I get a little controversial and ask for you to fight back. And we're uh, just kind of going through a few issues in, that are going on in our world. And so be sure and join us for that. But also, we're going to do a food drive, an Easter food drive. These are out there on the bulletin board, and it's a list of what you can shop for. One of the things that has happened over the past several months, and especially after the freeze, is all of the food banks are without food. And it's getting harder and harder to provide food to the needy. So there's a list of what you can buy and bring. And I'm encourage all of us to go shopping and, and grab a few of these items and bring them so that we can present them. And uh, we'll, we'll be helping. Thank you for being here. It's, it amazes me when, when we come and there's other people here. And by faith, I know there's people out there and we're glad you're here even if you're the three second people we're glad you stopped by but uh but those are, who are online we we trust you're there we hope you're there and we're thrilled you're there and we're just thankful that we can do that how how god is getting the message out we live in such an unbelievable time easiest time in the world to share jesus you realize that easiest time ever and uh, and we can't remain silent so my encouragement is go share Jesus get out there today and give him heaven